Hey, before we get going, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, eToro. Let's talk about trading. Maybe your MO is just stacking sats once a week, or you're one of those cowboy altcoin traders who go deep into technical analysis. I don't know. Maybe you're just a muggle and you're trying to get into this whole cyber cash thing. Maybe you actually do want to put some skin in the game, but you have no idea where to begin. Now there's one trading app for all of that, eToro. It's a trading platform and mobile app that lets you buy and sell cryptocurrency. And it's also the number one social trading platform in the world. Listeners, you might even be asking, what the hell is a social trading platform? Copy trading is a feature that lets you mirror the actions of top traders on the platform. This way, you can learn about due diligence and all the other technical things it might take months to pick up on your own just by copying the behavior of the top traders on the platform. So head over to eToro.com and get started on your portfolio today. eToro, smart crypto trading made easy. You need to embrace capitalism. Okay. It is this hope which is the lever of progress. My favorite Fed to keep. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. I'm Dave Hollerith. That song you just listened to was by Mr. Sue, our guest today. But before we get into the interview, I just want to bring up the fact that Bitcoin 2020, the official conference for the Bitcoin community, is happening at the end of March, and we're hosting. Leading up to March 27th and 28th, I've lined up a variety of different interviews with darknet market vendors. Bitcoin company CEOs and privacy experts. The idea here and for the foreseeable future is to keep you informed and educated about what's going on in the Bitcoin community as well as what's going on outside of the world of Bitcoin, whether it's in history, the economy, technology, or some other part of the internet, to help you understand and think on your own about the nature of value itself. Heady stuff. Also, next month, our very own CK Snarks has a four-part interview series with Bitcoin Tina. That'll be dropping soon. But anyway, I've talked enough. Today, I got an interview with a boy named Sue. Mr. Sue, Phil Gibson, writes for the Libertarian Institute. He's known about cryptocurrency for a while, but his journey into Bitcoin has been pretty recent. In that way, I think he offers a pretty fresh perspective for those of us who have been in the space for a while, myself included. Sue also just wrote a piece called Bitcoin is Dead. We talk about that, libertarianism, the Lightning Network, music, and a ton of other stuff. A quick FYI and shout out, Sue is a musician, and we're using his music for our intro and outro. Hope you guys enjoy it. Alrighty, here's the interview with Mr. Sue. Well, hey, Sue. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me, partner. This is pretty dope. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the way I found out about your work was through your article. Bitcoin is dead. Kind of a kind of clickbaity. Very much so. That's exactly what I was going for. It worked, and I, I read it, and uh, I liked it a lot. You actually referenced a lot of Bitcoin Magazine work, which... You know, we appreciate in the newsroom. Yeah, I, before we get any further, I want to sincerely apologize for everyone I ripped off, but I cited everywhere I could. I'm not really a writer, so I'm just kind of like learning as I go. So if I miscited my citations, I apologize. But uh, thanks to all of them for their great work and what they do. But they were a big help, and what they wrote was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you did a lot more citing than like most people do when they write put out articles on medium so like i think you're ahead of the game overcompensation i don't know <laughs> yeah maybe plan to safe i listen to your podcast too uh and i wanted to start off by just knowing how you got interested in the bitcoin conversation oh man uh so i'm gonna get in the line of the um libertarian uh to bitcoiner line because uh, right right <laughs> it's not like those are those are rare. Although I've been trying to learn more about Lightning and these partially signed Bitcoin transactions and all this crap, and then it's like maybe libertarians are the rarity because this seems really technical. But like, of course, <laughs> when you zoom out, it's all about like free money, like against the state kind of stuff. 
So, you know, I, I still feel at home. Yeah, yeah. Lighting stuff actually gets really complicated really quickly. Like, as ironic as it sounds, I'm so glad Layer 1 is so basic. Which is not, it, but yeah. it still is at some point. Yeah, and I think the logic is is that it's just so new that literally everyone who's working on it basically has to be a developer contributing to it. Yeah. You know? I finally uh, forced myself to learn something, and I just started trying to learn Python. But then I got so distracted by learning like my own command line and just learning how to make uh, like your own uh, directories and stuff. So I, I have a ways to go, but as long as I can be on that same kind of like like wavelength or like maybe a wavelength of a wavelength of like how developers think, then at least if I'm kind of like in that same mental frame, maybe it'll just be easier for me to understand like what all is kind of going on. Totally, yeah. Be- because it's it's I- I've noticed too. Developers uh, have trouble. I mean, it's not their job. They're they're trying to figure it out. So it's not their job to communicate what's going on. And so there's like naturally like a separation between them, how much they know, and everybody else. Yeah, and it's kind of funny in tech in general when you talk to a developer, especially if you're coming at it from a not tech perspective, like myself. You never get a yes or no answer. And it's yeah. so goddamn frustrating. It's like, does this mean this? It's like, well, it depends when you're... Stop. Like, no. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's like, God bless him, man. Like, we need people working on that. I was listening to the uh, TFTC that came out today with David Chow. And it's just amazing how he was starting... He was working on Bitcoin in high school. That is crazy. <laughs> like, what, are, what am I doing with my life? Like, why am I on this earth? <laughs> like... But we need people like that. Yeah, some people find it early, I guess. I guess. And then you just um, like get into Bitcoin, and then you like, like Bitcoin and like Marty and even um, I was listening to Citizen Bitcoin. Brady mentions all the time too that Bitcoin is like the Renaissance, the next Renaissance, and it's forced me to learn about economics. It's forced me to learn about tech, and just like computers in general and how the internet works, and like as as simple as like packet switching and it's really cool how everything is kind of like copy paste of what's happened to the internet already like on bitcoin and on lightning especially so i don't know if that was like intentionally planned like from the get-go maybe that's what satoshi kind of like mapped out like well just copy what the internet did It'll, it'll work i don't know but even like the philosophy and game theory it's it's a renaissance like it forces people to like be better or brings out a potential that they didn't know that they had not to say like i'm some renaissance man or anything but like for bitcoin itself i'm super thankful that it's like forced me to be someone that i didn't know i could be yeah what do you mean by that like like what you learned yeah well partially that's kind of like from libertarianism because you kind of had to unschool yourself of all the bs that you learned in school and how the world like really looks especially when it comes to economics and then it totally crumbles that left right paradigm when in reality like if you read rothbard apparently like libertarians are actually the most leftist and the most radical because i mean left just really means radical against the status quo of like the the old rights guard kind of authoritarian kings queens owners of the land kind of deal um so I don't know. Libertarianism, just at, as cringy as it is, it, it makes people quote unquote woke or it just a real or at least different perspective of how things are. But that's just kind of like what makes sense to me. And I feel like everyone kind of in the Bitcoin community, I'm not saying everyone, every Bitcoiner is like that libertarian anarcho side, but no. it's a vast majority. So maybe that's kind of like what propelled them to make Bitcoin in the first place. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've got to at least have a willingness to take a leap, sort of, as far as, like, what, you're, what you want to learn and, and, and what you're interested in in the future. And it's, like, it's a huge leap. You know, it's, like, I don't know if we'll really know. Like, if Bitcoin does take off, it's going to be wildly different, I think, than how we see it now just because we're just talking about it, you know? I know, but it's also crazy how fast things do change. But um, yeah, it, like 
especially hearing Kiara talk about the stuff, it's very sobering of what she brings, but it's always a safe, healthy reality check. Like, some of this might sound too good to be true, but we should at least be thankful for what has become of it. And, you know, be be humble, stack sats, like they say. Just just have some this even keel thing and do what you can to contribute to the community. But, you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Like, hyper-Bitcoinization is probably not the most ideal thing because I forget who else said this, but... Um, oh, it, it was Catherine C- Coley. Like, you know, everyone is going to get on the boat and a lot of people are going to get left behind and we definitely don't want that want that to happen we want to take of course the anti silicon valley approach like move slowly and don't break anything so yeah you just got to be patient yeah i mean i think that's one thing too about the bitcoin space which is interesting is that i i see both like the anti silicon valley approach that's what i i was like initially why i was initially tra- attracted to um cryptocurrency but then i also do see people trying to come in being like you know because i i think we do believe that it could potentially make a better world and uh you know i see companies running with that slogan all the time so it's like it's very it can be it's a little bit of both it's appropriate on lightning because that allows the flexibility but you know if what safedean says is true that as long as layer one is the strong, cohesive <laughs> core and it's supposed to make the central banks just abide, Lightning's kind of like the the guinea pig test of that. For sure it about is. It. Yeah. So, I mean, not, <laughs> not calling Lightning the Fed by any means, okay? No one freak out. But um, it, it really is. Like, this is our, our time to, like, test ourselves and, you know, how fast can we move and how fast shouldn't we move? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's actually get into your article. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> so, so you bring up a bunch of uh, realistic, you're basically, your, your article is basically explaining uh, with real world examples why Bitcoin grew in 2019. Um, and you kind of started off by like basically uh, debunking the hype and FUD around the idea that, yeah, that Bitcoin is dead. Um, so why did you write this? Well, I kind of say in the first paragraph that I had uh, just people in the community and friends and, of course, the media. Like, I, I point out on LinkedIn, it said on the side, if you think Bitcoin's not trading, it's because it's not. And uh, reading... Uh, Bitcoin magazine, I cited the article of, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of hobblers out there. So people are actually believing in it. What the mainstream media is putting out there isn't true. They're just being intellectually dishonest. And, you know, that could be just a fine example of them actually fearing its potential. Like I mentioned later on about the congressman that wrote that open letter to the Federal yeah. Reserve of, uh, yeah, I mean, people can go read the article. But I really kind of wrote this to, one, give myself like a high-level understanding of everything that I did understand about Bitcoin, just to like double-check. And and really just, I, I wrote it for other people as well, especially newer people, because I tried to give the high-level ideas of like how the network works and what it is, especially the second to last, or really the last paragraph, talking about like Nick Zabo and or unforgeable costliness and, uh, you know, hash cash. I wanted to put these basic principles out there about what Bitcoin is and how it works and take real life examples of how it's actually impacting the world and how people are benefiting from it. Like the right people are benefiting from it and the right people are afraid of it. So because we have these tangible examples, I thought it was a great opportunity. And of course, whenever there's FUD out there, you got to debunk the FUD. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned, you actually mentioned uh, modern monetary theory. MM, did I mention MMT? Oh, philosophy of monetary value. Okay, not MMT. Not, okay. not Neo Keynesian stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as I said, simply put, this theory claims monetary value is a thing 
that exists and is the same theory that Zabo used when he created BitGold and such value should come with unforgeable costliness. So basically, you know, a money has to have a value. That's just plain and simple. That's what it is. And like, where does it get its value? Well, like the Austrian theory is like value is subjective, but I mean, it's subjective, but also based off of the properties that a money carries. And in this case, what he wanted to do is replicate gold because gold is scarce and it's really hard and expensive to actually produce out of the earth. And he had to recreate that through bit gold or really Bitcoin. And he did that by uh, using uh, Adam Beck's hash cash, the, the proof of work. Because you were, <laughs> I kind of like to think of Bitcoin itself as like this ball of energy kind of deal. Um, <laughs> All right, go on. I, I, I just, because it's a bare asset, you know? So it's a thing. It's created like with energy, from energy. And I just kind of see it as like this glowing golden ball of energy. And it's like a bare asset because if I send you Bitcoin, like it's your Bitcoin, it's not mine anymore. It's not like email where I have like a copy of it and you have a copy of it. Like maybe we have like some sort of receipt, but like it's, it's almost like this tangible thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, as far as like the, the monetary, like uh philosophy of monetary value i mean that's just kind of like straight up what it is like money like as a philosophy like money is like a thing like the value of money exists so you have to have all these properties that actually are going to give it value and i mean satoshi did exactly that by using proof of work and uh, you know all the other great properties that bitcoin has but that's kind of what i was trying to get across but i think that's one of the most important properties because as you as we all see how expensive mining is and how it's not guarantee i mentioned this in one of the earlier paragraphs or sections in the article but it's not a guarantee that you're going to profit from it so i mean the the fact that fidelity and riot and layer one like all these mining companies are forming pools and probably because of like the hype cycle of this year uh, but people are willing to take their risks and through taking risks and these hype cycles of Bitcoin spurs this awesome network de- development effect, like this capital that just booms and it creates jobs and it might be for the short term, but even in the bear market, you like as the dust settles and every, everything clears, you know, there's a good percentage of people that are sincerely honest and curious about what is Bitcoin. So that clearly like you can't say that there is no value behind this yeah i I realize what you're saying about the ball of energy because of mining it's like liter. you're saying it's literally units of energy it's digital gold man like that's what he was going for and he achieved it well so you also bring up um hodling people talk about the lack of uh bitcoin transactions and at the end of 2019 compared to 2018 and you said that that was because of holding. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's just a case in point of people over time. Once they get to Bitcoin, after they win money or lose money, they actually invest in the time to learn what Bitcoin is and how. Right now, it is a store of value. Lightning's going to make it the peer-to-peer, you know, utopia that we dream of. Of course, it's not utopia. Uh, but because utopia is not a thing, that's why markets are efficient because you need to have uh, businesses fail and businesses, you know, that Darwinism. But uh, that aside, um, crap, what was I saying? <laughs> we were talking about holding. Yeah, holding. Uh, basically, people invested in themselves to learn more about Bitcoin, go down that rabbit hole, and learn that right now it's a store of value. And they. They are learning about the Fed and just the manipulation of monetary policy in the world and not just the United States and the bubbles that pop up here and there with, you know, whether it be Social Security, other healthcare in general, uh, housing, student loans. People will realize like, hey, we're uh, we're in deep doo doo. So we might as well grasp onto something, hodl for dear life and, you know, send this thing to the moon and we'll have our moon rocks slash Bitcoin that we're going to survive off of. So, you know, 
be humble stack sats on that on that end. So Trump tweeting about Bitcoin and then Bitcoin uh, Nigerians adopting it. Those were two <laughs> other points you you, you made. Yeah. Um, man, the Nigerian remittance hub. Uh, man, I can even remind myself who at Bitcoin Magazine wrote that, but it was it's Colin Harper, staff writer. That story just blew my mind. Now, I don't advise anyone to use Paxful on the daily. From what I heard, it can be scammy. Be careful. But the fact that it's worked for, I think, over half of the Ni- Nigerians. And uh, um, Paxful profited like $65 million in USD. And I think more than half of that came from Nigeria itself. So just the fact that this capital is there. I mean, Bitcoin is just a proven safe haven for people that need it the most. And unfortunately, it is in the most destitute of countries that are under the worst circumstances uh, in their economy with inflation. You know, we can talk about Venezuela, but they're just kind of like the the guinea pig, like yeah. the easy cop-out go-to. But it's just... <laughs> kind it's, of, yeah. It's just... <laughs> it's it's um it's beautiful man how how countries that do need a safe haven for money are able to get it through bitcoin now they got to cash it out for the crappy fiat currency but the fact that it's there and it's an option proves that you know when when it hits the fan in america i mean we have that option and and frankly, the feds see that as an option, too, as I point out in that section of the article about those two congressmen writing letters of, you know, creating some alternative. And really, that was kind of a snowball effect of the whole Libra thing. Whether or not that was a red herring, I really don't know. Libra? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's going anywhere. doesn't seem like it is. No, it's not. But, I mean, just the fact that something stupid like that it's super interesting though it's a super interesting concept you know it definitely is i'm people questioning hey can this big corporate entity actually issue its own currency and it very well could because of i mean look at all the people that use whatsapp in fact i think i think vin armani's uh his little Bcash project of like text people Bitcoin. Apparently that was in line to be the token on WhatsApp. And then I guess that went out the window when uh Libra came about. So that's just interesting. But, um, but, but, but the fact that there were other contenders to like do that. Yeah. But, but the fact that the government was going to shut it down either way, I don't know if, it's it was in Facebook's favor to be a large corporate entity, or maybe they were just trying to grandstand and get some more, uh, y- you know, access to to state funds and you know tax write offs. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, but I, it, yeah, I think about Disney Plus. Uh, Disney Plus added like you know like something like two million. I, I have no idea what the exact number is. They added a lot of subscribers within like the first two weeks of going live. And I think they did it through Verizon customers. And like, oh, wow. You know, that's like the thing about Facebook, though, is that they could do it. You know, Disney Plus did it with a streaming subscription. I I mean, obviously, it's like much harder to do it with money, but it's like kind of interesting to think about just because, you know, I think people talked about it, but you don't really know what that looks like until you see a company try and do it. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, take take Hayek's use of knowledge in society. Like, we can't predict the future, and um, I don't, it, it's it, it's it's anyone's call, really. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I mean, I feel like we, I feel like we're in agreement about how um, the real use case is for for the thing that's open source, like Bitcoin, the thing that's decentralized. Oh, no, definitely. It's, I mean, just, and I mentioned this in the article too, just the mere fact that people all around the world, it's not nearly enough, but the fact that people all around the world are running their own full nodes 
voluntarily contributing and they don't have to but they all understand the value that bitcoin is providing and they're seeing it through these examples whether it's nigeria or argentina or venezuela so it's it's great how it's just like incentives work but it's not it kind of goes beyond incentives as well it just people being nice for lack of a better word yeah what what are some like recent uh real world use cases you've seen that you haven't mentioned in this article uh about bitcoin i don't think there's really enough but one thing i did want to share was my own experience and it <laughs> of all things the re- the reason i was able to become ma- maximal ish um w- with bitcoin was one my customer experience with it or like losing my bitcoin virginity as i like to call it but i used it to buy my vpn on my phone oh yeah and why the hell would i have to call up and ask like my branch chairman of my bank i don't know but uh it w- i was buying a nord vpn and nord was like you know consult with your bank or whatever and I had to wait 20 minutes on the phone. And the lady's like, oh, you need to call the branch. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm just going to do this with Bitcoin and see what happens. Because there was three options, I think. It was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. And I kind of mentioned that I came from more of like an altcoiner side, I think. Uh, Vinermani and um, Sal Mayweather, who's like still a great friend. He was actually the first place I was blogging on was the new... Uh, uh, TNL, TNL blog, uh-huh. the new li- li- ah. <laughs> libertarian is so embarrassing. Like it's I somewhat identify with it, and I still have trouble with the word. But um, it's coming from this all coiner perspective. And then I heard uh, an- another friend, Donnie Gebert, on Freeman Beyond the Wall, and he had this talk about oh the fiat apocalypse, and we should really start looking in- into all these altcoins with the uses. So I bought my first cryptos were. Um, basic attention token because it was like JP Morgan, but you know, play it safe and the Hilton uses it. So there's a use case with that. And I bought Bitcoin cash after that because uh, yeah, yeah. thankfully I was able to to trade that with, with Sal because I thought it was really cool because Sal uses it kind of like as a checking account, but he uses BTC as like a savings account, which fair, like that's kind of like where we all should be in reality with BTC. But but still, like, I wanted to get, like, a, a big pay card, you know? And, like, you know, paying crypto and, like, dodge my taxes and everything. But, <laughs> like, but like, what's the point? Just just get Bitcoin, dude. And this, I go back to the, buying the VPN with Bitcoin because Bitcoin was, like, the number one thing up there. And, like, what other fine example of Bitcoin being the most valuable of cryptocurrencies and everything else being a copy? Like, hello? So... I guess it kind of comes full circle, but it just the mere fact that I was able to create my own use case and become a statistic, if you will. Uh, but it was just so empowering of how fast and easy it was. And I was able to have my VPN like right then, right there, right now. And, and then I found uh, the crypto economy podcast and yeah, I-, I went down that rabbit hole because just, kind of dropping all the altcoin stuff i was and and then buying the vpn with with bitcoin i was like there's got to be something to like this maximal mindset like they they can't all be assholes (laughs) you know and i had heard guy on the friends against government podcast which shout out to them they're the like pretty much main reason i started my own podcast those guys are hilarious if you have not listened to them no um yeah, Friends Against Government. They have a uh, very creative acronym, if you can sound that out. Um, it's FADCAST. Uh, censor that if you need to, whatever. But um, but Guy was on that, and it's just kind of stayed in the back of my mind. And then after I bought my VPN with Bitcoin, I'm like, okay, this is probably like the good place to start. So I went down the rabbit hole, but I it really caught my attention because Guy did the episode on an article that Sal did which was the economics of Bitcoin maximalism. And I actually had Sal on my show talking about that article. And uh, like, frankly, it was a little vain to me, but like it caught my attention mostly because 
uh, in the article, like I get like a shout out and then like to hear like my show on guys uh, podcast. I'm like, okay, you got my attention. And then I heard that episode and then I listened to probably hours, years worth of stuff. And it was great. And especially him reading stuff from the Mises Institute. Yeah. And it kind of went back to my libertarian roots and, uh, you know, thank God for Dave Smith. Otherwise it wouldn't be a, uh, you know, anarcho capitalism. <laughs> so yeah, if we can have more use cases of like buying VPNs and, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm kind of asking for more status barriers in a way, which no one wants, but, um, I don't know. What about you? Like, have you seen any other awesome use cases of Bitcoin? Yeah. I mean, I'm mainly looking at like economies, so like places where it could be necessary, and I, and I I look at like Lebanon as like a pretty good use case. Um, they, they have like a pretty bad economic crisis right now, and um, the banks. Thank God for Safe Dean then. What? I said thank God for Safe Dean. Yeah, yeah. Is he Lebanese? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. He. he no. He. I. I'm pretty sure he teaches at the University of Lebanon. I don't know if he's in the States like permanently. I, I'm not yeah. sure, but I'm pretty sure he's from there. I should track him down and figure that out. Yeah, get him on the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, so uh, I, a lot of times I look at like uh, economies, uh, like China, I think is interesting. I, it, it looks like there's a lot of China. There's a lot of crypto flight out of China. A lot of people who are getting their money um, into crypto in China, I guess, is a way oh, to protect yeah. it. <laughs> And that really goes into all the sovereign like individual articles and the privacy aspect of and like just Bitcoin providing that option to opt out. Yeah. Like that's what those people need. And that's just so empowering. Like one of the most empowering things about Bitcoin. First of all, my favorite thing is of how it's just Austrian econ baked into the protocol and is the one living proof of what we have of like in anarcho capitalist society like functioning, but also having it provide the option to opt out because your wealth is stored in your head. Okay. And no one can take that away from you. Unless they shoot you. But I mean, what good does that do? Cause then they don't have the information cause it was in your head and now it's in your soul. Find a way to heaven or whatever you believe in. <laughs> so it's, I, <sighs> Just the the notion of being a sovereign individual. And maybe I'm putting too much stock into that because Bitcoin is not the global standard currency yet, hopefully, fingers crossed. But again, we have to like take this slow, as I said earlier. But just everything that it does have to offer. And I have yet to run a full node. Like I'm still trying to figure out like what what's good for me and you know, maybe I need to get to do my own research into the proper setup, but it, just the freedom that it offers and, and understanding how it is both a store of value, but it is cash and like that cash is in your head and no one can take that away from you. And that's what the people in China really, really need. And unfortunately they are uh, having, I, I think they're going to be used this bastardized version of a blockchain where whatever they do is pretty much it's like a surveillance state. We I guess we kind of already have that now as far as having our payments being tracked. I mean, hell, I almost got flagged for trying to buy a VPN. But um, you know, th this is what the people in China really need at, at this point is like true freedom of money because Bitcoin, of all things, it is <laughs> like the decent knowledge in society paints this beautiful picture of how. Austrian economics is pretty much F you to the central planners. Like, how dare you try to dictate my life and tell me what to do and what not to do with my money, especially if it's Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the ultimate F you money, if you think about it, because of all the capabilities that it provides. So that's really kind of like the, the most recent shower epiphany I've had. Like, you know, you see whether it's like Ty Lopez or, you know, all these billion dollar whatever people. Like the true F you money is Bitcoin. Hands down. Yeah. Nonviolent resistance. Civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. Yeah.
Um, yeah, it's Gandhi. But uh, weird question. Uh, what's your retirement plan? <laughs> what's retirement? <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> what's a mortgage? Like, I'm not planning on buying a house, <laughs> dude. Like, Where do you live, anyway? I live in Austin, Texas, which oh, nice. apparently is the mecca of Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no mecca of Bitcoin. It's decentralized as fuck. I, dude, <laughs> yeah. Fair fair point. God damn me. That, I just spoke blasphemy. I'm sorry. No, there's definitely a lot of people uh, in the Bitcoin community <laughs> in Austin, show. though. Oh, yeah. I um, I guess I'll spoil it. I interviewed Parker Lewis uh, th- this past Saturday, and um, I'm going to start going to that Bitcoin meetup which is the Bitcoin dead meetup. So even greater incentive to be less shitty at coding. So I'll be way behind on what they're working on, but as long as I'm a fly on the wall, just soaking up as much information, information as I can, I can't say I'm not going to learn anything. So at least there's that, but, um, it's, it's amazing, dude. Just how Bitcoin itself attracts people from all these different factions, every corner of the world, it is like a renaissance of ideas. Not not a ton of, of federal employees, I noticed. Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> Something, well, uh, just think of all the technological innovations that come from the military. Dude, DARPA, DARPANET, dude. It's It was created like for military purposes. And PGP had to be fought for by Phil Zimmerman for it to be in the public domain. And SHA-2. Yeah, dude, SHA-2. And public key cryptography, I came, I think, came from MI6. So it's like, you know, I actually had a um, uh, recent podcast, I think it's episode 118, with a Dexter De La Paz, who um, is into, like, cryptids and whatnot and conspiracy theories. But the first part of that is like, dude, is Bitcoin a PSYOP? Like, think of all, like, the military intel technology that goes into it. Like, hopefully it's not. Like, hopefully all these cypherpunks were true to, like, we're going to give privacy back to people and, you know, sovereignty, which I think I think they are. And to be fair, I've been listening to uh, people like Jesse Powell of Kraken and, uh, you know, people that are just fighting against regulation for the exchanges, but working with people in the space and learning all these people that are on the KYC AML side, you know, they truly think that they're doing something right. And they're just, you know, putting on their pants one leg at a time, going to work and thinking they're doing a civil service and God bless them. Like the fact that I, I believe a majority of the people that work for the government feel like they're doing something good. For sure they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just the eighty twenty rule. Like eighty percent are just the rank and file and good at heart, hopefully. And then some of them are just meticulous mother truckers who, you know, uh, are are uh, mal incentivized. And if anything, the state drives the worst kind of incentive, which which is no incentive. But <laughs> you you get into like the political economics versus true economics and uh what do you yeah what do you mean by political economics so it's just uh it's just a matter of like incentive structive where you have like if you have a bureau of central planners planning things out i'm it's it's kind of like if you look at like a a government job like like the dmv like there's no true incentive whereas in the it's, it's differentiating differentiating like the public sector versus the private sector like this is i think chapter four in the Ron Paul manifesto that I would encourage everyone to read, but you know, it's just like as the state, all it does is consume off the private sector. The ones that actually put their own funds into risk and, you know, the market trying to be at play the best that it can and trying to fight against the arbitrary, like barriers to entry with taxation and everything. But the private sector is actually, creating innovations and testing things out and failing and you have the public sector who are just you know through taxation taking all these resources and misallocating them so you know that was a very like high level 
maybe lack of understanding of how that works, but you know, I'd encourage people to read that chapter. I think it's chapter four, but again, again, like military tech, you know, a lot of innovation came from that. So it's kind of a, <laughs> a lot of the times when you're, you're trying to figure out the answers of the world, you kind of contradict yourself. So it's always a nice reality check to j- just constantly check yourself and like prove yourself wrong or right and um i don't know no one has all the answers but you don't want to like stop yourself from trying trying to learn yeah so yeah sue i got a random question um yeah if you had to live in a different time period and you could pick any which time period would you live in i don't know like watching days and confused and like being a like a music fan like i play guitar so Saying that I saw Led Zeppelin back in the day would, would be pretty yeah, cool, be but sweet. even in the even in the '70s, I could find some something to bitch about. That's a good but, point. But yeah. Um, yeah, probably probably then. If I was a boomer, I guess that'd be pretty cool. Like be born at the late '50s, and you can like, as a kid, live through the Beatles, and then like when you come to age, that would be like the ripe time to like start a band, and then you could have the the choice to like take like the Led Zeppelin ishy route. Or like the punk route, or uh, you know, hell, even be born like in my parents' uh, generation, like the late seventies, and like go through those eras, which I think there were some questionable times in the eighties. Some of the hair metal was, uh, <laughs> dude. I love prog rock, I, I, dude. Ah, uh, I'm I'm gonna upset some uh, listeners, maybe like the prog. I only recently started really respect Rush after watching the documentary of them on Netflix, but um. Yeah, dude. All right, you gotta check out uh, ELO. You gotta t- check yeah. out Yes. I just don't like. I know there's math rock. I just don't like music that has to make me think. Dude, too so hard. many people give so much shit to prog rock. <laughs> I, dude, I have mad respect for it. Like, I, I'm no, I know there's good prog out there. You, you need to send me some links. Yeah, uh, yeah. I bet most of our listeners do not give a shit. <laughs> give a shit about what? Like no, music no, no, prog rock. <laughs> but uh, oh, they should. Yeah, well. Like Tom Woods, man. Like the anarcho capitalist of anarcho capitalists, like loves Prague. And Neil Peart. Oh. oh yeah. God God Godspeed. Remember him. He was a drummer, insane drummer, and he wrote, he wrote his most lyrics of the lyrics. I think his best lyric that yeah. like at least pertains best to this conversation is even if you choose not to decide, you still make a choice. It it kind of goes hand in hand. It's, it's like uh like I think it's in the book The Stranger. Camus. Where the whole yeah. notion is like Nothing matters, but that's why everything matters as well. Gospy and Newport. Really, I'm a musician first. Really? Yeah, man. Um, like I, I, I like forced myself to write this article because I felt like I had to just to like uh, my understanding of Bitcoin and everything. Like the intro and outro music of my show. That's me. Yeah, it's good. Thank. It's really good. Thank you. Um, that is uh by my buddy Abram Olve. Really? Go hit him up a bum on the twitter but uh abram olve he's a great drummer he was drumming on that and he produced it and then i uh wrote the lyrics and the guitar and the everything else on that like the chorus is come for the scandal stay for the content every time you suffer you're you're one step closer right where you're supposed to be and um i don't know i just thought that was something like really powerful everyone can relate to like when you think something sucks um yeah, you just make yourself stronger, you know, not to rip off Kanye or anything. But, um, you know, I, I think that that's that's a good thing to remember, especially as Bitcoiners and, you know, as as tough as, as it is when we're trying to figure out, you know, what's this what is this scaling thing going to look like during the bull run? You know, when layer one gets clogged with high fees, like is lightning going to be able to scale and even compete with fees on top of that? So. You know, it's kind of like trying to get over those obstacles and really uh, getting over the obstacles of understanding how Bitcoin works and just getting over the obstacles of like your daily life as well and just challenging yourself to learn and better yourself. So that's kind of like what the whole song of that was wrapped up in. But I was, I've been playing guitar, not as much as I wish, but uh, I started when I was 10 and, um, you know, wanted to like join a band, but it's really hard to find the right people to jive with. So, um, I don't know. I got stuck doing podcast and Bitcoin stuff. So, 
hopefully it hopefully doesn't turn into a complete waste of time but i but like i um you know of all the art ideas for articles what i want to do is encapsulate that like in a song because whether you're whatever message you're trying to get out it's really about changing the culture like car camp it from the friends against government podcast really like emphasizes this like if you want to change people's minds, you you got to change the culture. If you want to spread a message, like Michael Malice brings this up, like pol- pol- politics is downstream from culture. And, you know, there's no truer statement than that. So, you know, if I can embody like these principles of freedom into, you know, fun, catchy songs everyone can enjoy, you know, maybe I can like propagandize them into, you know, being a hodler. Who knows? But, you know, once I can get, get, like, the time and resources to, like, really bucket down to, like, focus on, like, music and the podcast full time, like, that's hashtag goals right there. Um, I feel like a song about Bitcoin, I, I've heard a few songs about Bitcoin, and I feel like a really good song about Bitcoin would not have lyrics about Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, you got to be really, because if it's, like, Bitcoin... And you make all these like proof of work puns and shit. Like it's 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 not gonna fly, dude. <laughs> um, you, you have to be subtle so with it. Bad. Like, um, yeah, Matt O'Dell was saying about the BTC Pay merch. How it's got to be subtle. Like, just maybe like a small l- little logo or not e- even a logo. Like on the merch that you sell, it's like, you know, it, it's got to be kind of like a subculture thing. Like someone notices the hat or the shoes. Or, like, the football player that wears the BTC pay cleats. It's that. Like, it's got to be classy. It's got to be kind of, like, this nice undertone where it's, you know, <laughs> it's humble. Like, stay humble, stack sets. Like, it's that kind of message that you have to portray. So, you know, it's not to take the, um, oh, you don't understand kind of thing. Like, this, this little subtle, like, art smidge against, like, the, the corporate, like, public. But, um... Yeah, it, it can't be tacky at the same time, you know? Yeah. Dude, I think that's a really good place to end this on. Thanks again, guys, for listening. We're going to go out one of Sue's songs. You can find his podcast, writing, and music through his Twitter handle, at Mr. P-S-E-U. Mr. Sue. All right, take care. The Bitcoin Magazine Podcast is a BTC media produced podcast on the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find us on Twitter at Bitcoin Magazine and you can find out about other engaging shows we produce by subscribing to our feed on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Peace.